we'll we'll touch on balance to start because I think that is the the part that you know the most about, the most informed about, and we can move on from there. So with Smite being a, a hyper competitive game on the same side that is also a casual game, it's obviously very difficult to balance. So just how do you balance and take both sides of the casual and pro experience to like make the game as, as balanced as you can? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things is understanding that you can't please everyone. You're going to make decisions that are that are not going to excite some portion of the player base, no matter what you do. But you want to keep in mind, um, you know, those that are due to to get some love. So you know, if if like for the world's patch in particular, we're going to be a lot more focused on SPL level play because it's worlds. The first few patches of a new year, those are usually a little bit more casual friendly because we want to to make sure that that portion of the player base is, you know, feeling like they're being seen and heard and respected and all that kind of stuff. And because pro play doesn't really start until a little bit later in the year. So you've seen what it's, it's where it's been difficult for gods like Yemoja, where she is dominant yeah. at a pro level. Uh, and we've been very open about her struggles in the majority of players' hands. And I, I don't think there is necessarily a perfect answer or if there is i don't i don't know what it is quite yet we're still trying to figure out some of those things but it's really just trying to worry less about achieving the perfect balance and like we've done it the game's balanced like we're done here like that doesn't happen um and so it's just how can we make the the game more fun for as many players as possible right now and then continuing to ask yourself that question like every day for the rest of your existence (laughs) and that also is kind of why uh... I think it was last year when you guys made this brand new map, you added in all these new things. You also added in like the, it was like 30 seconds also at the beginning of the match, just for like the casual player to be able to see those items. And the pros and the higher level players were obviously not happy with that because they wanted to get in the game as quick as possible. But I mean, you have to like give and take every once in a while. And that is part of the give for the casuals and a little take from the pros. So. Yeah, but those 30 seconds, Bobby, I mean, yeah, no, they're just never those. getting those back. No, you know? They're never those. getting them back. So, yeah, we usually add those at the beginning and then take it take it away eventually because we don't, you know, we don't want to rob everyone of that for as, in, until we need to. Yeah, yeah. For all the competitive or, or all the game modes, I should say, is there like a fine line between Conquest being the premier competitive game mode and then all the other modes are like the more casual modes? Like, is there a clear line drawn in the sand that you want to try to just make those game modes as fun as possible for the casual and then obviously have some semblance of casual balance in competitive, but mostly for the pros? Yeah, I I think, you know, we never come to the table with, hey, this is what's happening in Assault or Arena. But if we're talking about a god that is problematic, you know, we will think, okay, or take a look at their data for those non-conquest modes and see, you know, where their strength lies. Because you can also use those modes as a good indicator of, you know, what a god's strengths are or are not. A god that performs particularly well in arena, assault, and conquest probably does pretty well with team fights. Um, whereas a god who is only good in conquest in comparison to arena and assault uh, probably gets a lot of their win rate by how quickly or how efficiently they can farm where that's not nearly as important in some of those other modes. I think the the big thing is also in designing new gods and new items and new features, uh, making sure that all of those new things feel good in modes that are not just conquest. I think that's something that I definitely needed some, some time to understand and that, you know, we can't just design new items and new gods for conquest only that's that is always our primary objective you know making sure it feels right in the smite mode um but you know there are players who only play assault or joust or arena you know whatever those those players are just as much smite players as conquest players so we need to make sure that we aren't making things or um adjusting gods that without them in mind uh You know, the non-conquest balance, I think, has done a lot to help us in that area. I think there's still a lot that 
could be improved upon when it comes to non-conquest balance, particularly readability in the lobby. Um, and before you load in, you know, when you're locking in a god that has non-conquest balance, you know, letting players know and making that easier to inspect uh, yeah. on things like console. But I do think that that's helped us a lot in allowing us to adjust gods that were hard for us to adjust before uh, because of their popularity or um, strength in those modes uh, that are not conquest. So I think that that's helped us for sure. Yeah, I mean, that was literally the Zeus problem where he dominated those non-quest modes so hard that you can't even buff him in conquest, even though he's, he was pretty much a dead god up until this patch. And you probably were able to from that non-conquest change. So that's always mm -hmm. interesting just seeing like how a god dictates one game mode is completely irrelevant in another. And it's also mm -hmm. with the, those defense items and like cloak and stuff like that, like those items are so much stronger in like arena and slash. So yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, when you go through these patch notes and, and you've created this sheet of just a bunch of changes, do you have like an expectation or a prediction of like what the meta is going to kind of shift to? Like, do you have guesses towards that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, occasionally on a really big like new season patch, those I think, you know, we, we take some time and theory craft what we think the meta is going to be. But for the most part, it's kind of a waste of our time um, yeah. on those new season patches for a regular middle of the year uh, patch. Yeah. I, I feel like I've got a really good hold of what I expect the, it to do to the meta and how I think the meta should change because of those changes. You know, we we're making these changes with purpose, you know, um, yeah. they aren't, they aren't just happening to happen. You know, it's uh, at some points I think that, we do look for changes just for, for changes sake, just to try and keep some characters fresh, some, yeah. some items fresh, you know, the meta fresh as we can. Um, but yes, I, I definitely have an idea of what I think will happen to the meta. How often is that what actually happens to the meta? <laughs> Not all the time. Um, but I think that that's good. You know, I, I don't think that it would be right for um, anyone to just, be the the meta dictator you know we've got a team that that does balance and i think it's good that we aren't set on okay this is going to be a mage adc meta you know what i mean like yeah we're buffing mage adcs they might be good um they might not be you know we don't go in with those types of goals of setting metas we we go in with the idea of hey this class hasn't uh, felt particularly strong. We've heard feedback that this class is overbearing. The data set tells us this third thing. How can we take all these ideas and kind of mix them into what this patch should be? So yeah, we have an idea, but we're not always right. Yeah, and I mean, you could probably predict like the casuals when they first get into it, like you hard buff Mage ADCs, they're going to try them. And then yep. SPL happens and Mage ADCs still aren't getting touched, not yep. getting looked at even, and it just happens like that. And that's like the difficulty. The SPL players just come up with some some funky things for sure. Mm -hmm. For creating new gods and like maybe reworks and stuff like that, is there any mechanic or ability that you had this like really good idea with that you just weren't able to add because of limitation regions or you just couldn't find a way to properly balance it? And if you oh, have something sure. that comes to mind, do you, do you have like an example? Yeah, I mean, so to give a little bit of insight on how we come up with God kits, you know, we do a lot of brainstorms across a lot of different teams. We give these teams an idea of, Hey, here's Maui. Here's what we want him to look like. Generally, he's going to be a support. We want to focus on his hook as part of his main gameplay. Um, and here are some of his lore stories. What should he do? And then we kind of do that with a bunch of different teams. And then we come in and we do, uh, we make three kits that are completely separate from one another, you know, passive and then four abilities, uh, basic attacks, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we present those to some of the other designers and they'll go, hey, OK, I like this ultimate is really cool. I like this movement ability or this clear ability. This passive could work really well with this other ability. And we kind of mix and match it from there to create the kit. There have been a bunch, a bunch of different abilities that have made my various three kit pitches that uh <laughs> have not made it to to gods quite yet i don't want to give up too many of them um because 
it is very common for us to repurpose an ability. You know, if we think an ability is is cool, but maybe it didn't fit really great thematically, or um, you know, a kit can have only have so much complexity um, in terms of what it takes from for the programming team or the effects team or the animation team. Some gods get more complexity budget than others, uh, just based on where they fall on the schedule. You know, what those teams are working on, um, and Sometimes you have to make some calls on, hey, this part of the kit is more important than this other part, so I'm going to cut some complexity from this one ability in order to preserve it. For some examples, E-Shell is a good one. So E-Shell 3, that's the that's the little rainbow crash down where it yeah. hits in the circle. My initial design for that ability was for it to not really care about where you're landing the circle, but for it to be a little bit more like how Yorm alt, he does the arch and then it crashes down in the middle and does it yeah. and does some damage there. Uh, I wanted to try and make an ability that 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 was the idea was where you wanted to aim over your target and then have the crash down be the part that mattered a little bit more. But because of the the rest of how her kit was flowing and some tech limitations on making uh, a material that can be varied in length and then have to repeat over and over again to hit your desired length and then be strong enough looking to then collapse and have the fidelity that we wanted that's the word i'm looking for um on having that clarity and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that's 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 a difficult task and so we ended up swapping it to what it is uh what it is now yeah that's just that's just one example that i can think of of um you know, an ability that had to get changed a little bit because of some uh, some complexity issues. That, that's interesting that you, when you create these characters, you try to keep them to like a certain complex level. Like you don't want to go above that level because I mean, yeah, maybe it looks good with the, the kid or something like that, or, or maybe it flows well, but having maybe a, a simple ability here or there on even like highly complex champions makes them just probably flow a little bit better and then better for just like the overall experience for most players. Yeah. It's not, it's not even about the the complexity in terms of using the ability. I think that that's something that my gods have historically struggled with is that I think that I've made my gods too, too difficult on average, but I'm saying even in terms of tech complexity oh, okay. and that where things, you know, the, the idea of an E shell three that where you care more about the collapsing centerpiece isn't particularly difficult concept to wrap your mind around yeah. but a reason why e shell came out feeling so smooth and so polished is because instead of, instead of spending a bunch of time on making this tech work we could spend time on polish and making sure that it feels really smooth and so that's why limiting your tech complexity is really good because you end up with a more polished feeling product than you know a bunch of very cool things that don't quite feel like they work exactly the way they should yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. When you said complex, I thought you meant like how you play the character, but it was just like designing them and, and right. you have a no, certain no, it's, amount of it's a lot both. of time. Yeah, that's yeah. the hard part is that it's both, right? It's like making it the right amount of complexity for players and on or and on the tech end, I mean, um there there's there's a lot of things that, that need to be taken into consideration when you're talking about God design, for sure. Next up is a, a, a little bit more of a simple one, more <laughs> towards you. What does like an average day kind of look like for you? So we start our days with daily standups where we talk to the rest of the team about what we're working on that day, you know, if we have any blockers, anything like that. I spend a lot of my week in various meetings, uh, whether it be balance meetings or, you know, planning meetings. I think something that surprises most people is how far out we have to work when it comes to planning bigger features. So, you know, we, before Christmas, we were working on planning things for the middle of next year, you know, into, Jeez. into the springtime of next, next year. So we have to work really, really far ahead uh, in terms of those, you know, bigger features and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So a lot of meetings, um, we play test uh, every afternoon. So most of the days, and then I've got a, you know, I, I write a lot of voice packs. Um, and it's also just kind of where I am in the God pipeline. You know, it's so, one thing that I like about this job is that it's so varied. Um, you know, if I'm in the middle of working on a God, then I'm going to need to be doing a bunch of testing on them, you know, playing some bot or matches with them to see if I can find any bugs, uh, working with the QA team, the programming team, the effects team, whatever it may be. Or I could be 
brainstorming for the next god that I'm working on, um, you know, working on some of those three kits. It's a lot of meetings where your time is set. And then the rest of my day outside of play tests is usually like get these these things done in whatever order I want to get them done. So it's just prioritizing, you know, our voice packs do, do I need to come up with some ideas for a big feature? Do I need to implement um, balance? So when we when we make a decision about, hey, we want Ymir alt to cost less mana, myself, Lermy, Clumsy, you know, one of the designers will go in, really it's me and Lermy who will go in and make those changes. So it's a lot of getting your work done kind of on your own schedule, which I think uh, works works for me pretty well. Yeah, especially having the the little child running around being able to go if he's crying or something, go help him. And yes, yeah, that is that is key for sure. That is key. And with the different amount of things that you do, balancing, creating new gods, playtesting, I know is probably one of your favorite parts of the job. Do mm -hmm. you have like a favorite part? Like, is there anything you really look forward to or? You know you get to get to it next week, and that's what you're getting through this week just to get to that. Yeah, I love the research phase for new gods where I can just spend a lot of time, you know, diving into the lore of a god, um, you know, finding some good sources. I There was a really great book that I found about a lot of Polynesian gods when I was working on Maui, and I spent a ton of time just reading about a bunch of different Polynesian gods because I find that stuff so interesting. Um, so I love the research phase uh, of new gods and I love putting together the three kit because you just get to make three different kits for this god and it's always really exciting and fun to like get to present that. Narrowing it down to the one kit is where it gets hard because you have to leave a lot of stuff you like like on the cutting room floor. But I think that those are my two favorite things is the research phase for a new god and whenever I've done all the brainstorms, the brainstorm process is super fun and then trying to find a way it's it's very stressful to like make sure that you're getting the three kits that you like uh kind of set up and ready to go that's always like one of the parts that i'm the most stressed during but it's also one of my favorites because it's taking all these puzzle pieces that you've kind of generated and and fitting them together in their own way which i think is really really fun i never knew that you had to create three different kits yeah just for like the one character and then you probably have to like bring it and then everyone kind of chips in on on their thoughts about it and it, yeah it's also interesting that you probably maybe you come in with like the three three different kits but you probably have a favorite every single time where it's like every uh, time. i hope that they like this one a little bit more yep yeah it, oh man it's like when you have a kit that you really like but you will i mean there have been times i forget who it was before i was full-time design but i would i would sit in on a lot of these meetings and that kind of stuff whenever I got the chance. Some there have definitely been times where it's like, hey, I don't have three kits. I've got like two. And that's and that's acceptable. Like it's not like you need to have three. There are a lot of times where you have three kits and then hey, here's four other abilities that I thought of that I just like but didn't, you know, have a particular home for them. Yeah. Um I think there was a god, I don't wanna I don't want to spoil it without her permission, but I think one of Lermy's gods, uh one of the abilities was just one of those extra abilities that she didn't find a place for that all of us really liked. And we turned it into one of the main abilities. So yeah, that's just like where you can get really wild. I have a bad habit of putting all of my wackiest uh, abilities into one kit where it's like the most unhinged kit. And I know, I know AJ and clumsy are just going to like shake their head <laughs> the whole time while I'm in the middle of that kit, but I just can't help it, man. I gotta, I gotta get it out. And I remember it, I think Maui's third kit was like, I knew there was a 0% <laughs> chance of any of those abilities getting accepted, but I liked them. So uh, I wanted, I wanted to see what, uh, what they got on there. And I was right. Zero of those abilities got accepted, <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was still fun anyways. It's probably fun just describing the kit to them. Even if you know, they're not going to like it, just laying it out like the mastermind you are at that point. Yeah, ex yeah, or like, what have we done? Like, I probably shouldn't have gone with my unhinged pitches on my first uh, on my first three kit. That was probably a new mistake by me. They could have realized what what you know what they'd signed themselves up for. So now you're saying the fourth fourth god you make is going to be unhinged. Well, I mean, would you say that Maman is not unhinged in her own right? Wait, she's your fourth. 
No, she's my third, but she's oh. oh well, and you know, I I worked a lot on Bake uh, as well, so I've kind of got like three and a half right now. But I think I've already hit unhinged. Like Maman's not okay. Maman's not that unhinged. Oh, you think I can go more unhinged? Okay, from my perspective, she's not that unhinged. Oh, okay, just, cool. Okay, well now, okay. No, maybe that's she, great. No, no you, that's unhinged. great. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> you want to hear? I did have an unhinged pitch for Maman that did not Let's make it. it in. Uh, I'm ready. Her, her dash, the possession, um, we knew we wanted to do something with possession. It's a big part of her lore. Um, yeah. And we had a couple hard and fast rules on that. We were never going to let you control the other person, uh, like Jockey from Left 4 Dead 2. We were never going to do that. <laughs> we were never going to let you cast their abilities, anything like that. All of those mechanics are so inherently frustrating. But I did have a pitch where instead of just dashing one into one god, it was... If the if the ability something we do is like here's an ability here's an ability and if we wanted to go ultimate level on it like if we wanted to really take it to eleven here's what we would do I did have a version of that dash where it was an ultimate but you could chain your dash into multiple enemies so you could dash out of one god and into another enemy god and then into another enemy god and kind of do some nonsense stuff that way that's uh, unhinged we were right to move away from that. Uh, from that ultimate, I think for sure. Yeah, that sounds a lot more unhinged than what we got with Maman. Maman's just the passer. That's all you got to worry about. That sounds crazy. That sounds. It's almost like uh, it would have had to do a lot of damage too, because it's an ultimate. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, yeah. Maybe maybe we stick with Maman's level. Stick a little bit underneath that, at least for. Oh no, no, you said it's fine. Maybe I'm one down more god. Yep. Now uh, shifting away from balance and more towards roles and what their position is in, in like Smite. Uh, soul mm -hmm. lane is a pretty contentious role. You have some players that think that they should just be meat shield. Some players that think they need to be doing damage. You need to threaten back lines. What do you think in, and obviously not every warrior is the same. So it's not like every warrior has to follow this, but for the average warrior, what do you think their role should be in smite? Should it be early game dominance transition into a late game character that can kind of, you know, be a little frustrating to the backliners? Like what's your idea of like the average warrior? Yeah. So I, I want to start one. answering this question with, um, these are all my opinion and you would be, I think the average person would be shocked at how little my opinion shapes the decisions that I think are right for the game. Just because I like something doesn't mean, or think something should be, you know, this is the best way for something to be. That does not immediately mean that I'm going into balance meetings and banging my fist that, you know, <laughs> this is how it should be. Uh, that's not how it works. Not yet, um, at least. Maybe. Not maybe yet, at least. Yeah. God. When I become Czar of Smite, then <laughs> uh, you will be subject to what I want. But until then, that is not how it works. All of that being said, I think we've learned a lot of lessons when it comes to Warriors. I think we learned from right after 9.5 that they can't carry zero threat on backline. Um, they have to be able to threaten backline into the late game, uh, or else the class loses its whole purpose. They also can't be too good early game or else they jungle. Uh, and they are very oppressive in the jungle. Yes, they That are. is not to say that the occasional Erlang, Osiris, Gilgamesh, jungle, whatever, isn't actively cool because I obviously, th I, I think that it is, but that isn't where we want warriors to be played the majority of the time because then if they're being played there, then, you know, where are assassins being played? I personally think that warriors need to be able to build in a way that maintains their threat over a longer period of time. They shouldn't be particularly bursty, or if they are particularly bursty, it should be very easy to Aegis said burst. And they need to be able to withstand some amount of punishment from enemy backline. So, you know, if we're talking philosophical levels of smite, I think if a backline, if an ADC at six items and a warrior at six items, and they both have all their relics, hit everything against one another, I do think the ADC should win the majority of the time. Unless the warrior has uh, particularly over-invested in winning that 1v1, in which case they should be very susceptible to the mage. I think if the backliner does not have any relics, and the warrior has foregone some amount of survivability, then it is reasonable for them to win that that engagement but it shouldn't be quick uh it should be peelable you know 
uh, counterplayable. I think we've always had the most problems whenever warriors can just face roll their keyboard, miss however many abilities they're going to miss, and just look unkillable. Glad shield. Yeah, glad shield. <laughs> um, but they need some amount of glad shield, or else they don't have threat. Right. I mean, so, heal glad shield. That one was the, yes. That, that was the was that was something. the worst iteration for sure. They need to do some amount of damage into the late yeah. game. You know, I think what we have right now is early looking pretty good you know i'm happy with how the meta seems to be shaping up right in time for worlds warriors historically in smite have always been this jack of all trades master of none and i do think that that is an identity worth trying to um reinforce but they can't be truly master of none or else they really don't get played i do think that it is not as simple as bring back hybrid items or you know buff all of their protections or early game damage against the wave, you know, whatever it may be. I understand that warrior mains had a little bit of a dark stretch. It uh, was more than warrior mains. It was. Yes. Yeah, solo, solo yeah. tank players, solo tank enjoyers, you know, they understandably had a little bit of a rough stretch and <laughs> I do wish that we could have done more to help them earlier or been better about our help. Yeah, uh, to be I fair, guess a better way to say it. you did put out a couple patches to try and fix it. And with the way that it was talked about in that meta, it didn't seem like it was like they were that much better than Warriors. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of a nerf here, a little bit of a nerf there, didn't literally change anything. Mm -hmm. And then you had to just absolutely gut the mages for them to finally fall into meta. And to be fair, on top of that, when the players saw the patch, they still were like, nah, not, not enough. enough. Not enough. Not enough. They expected mages to be played at this qualifiers, which was wild to read with, with the patch notes. Yes, I was. <laughs> I was very concerned. You were when, distraught when that was the, for a couple. Days. I was distraught. <laughs> I was. I was because you know I don't want to see our players unhappy, uh, mm -hmm. and I was worried that they would be, um, and that we would have a meta that people weren't enjoying. Um, I think you did. But I think they very much like this this patch, and I think a lot of them enjoy the game a lot more currently than. They probably have it in like a little bit at least. Yeah, I think Warriors are, are looking to be pretty good right now, clearly. Um, and like I said, like they, they had a tough stretch this year, but Warriors have been dominant in a lot more metas where they've been, than where they've been useless. Yeah. You know, they have been all over the, you know, their itemization, their class has been abused much yeah. more than it's been abused. Bro, um, early season 10, Sigil Warriors. Like, it was a tank meta at the beginning of the <laughs> that's year. That's crazy. Yes. The gamers, you know, it's not Smite players. It's all gamers have very short memories, but very deep nostalgia tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and some might say that their memory might even be a little selective at times. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we have to be a little bit better as designers about not forgetting those lessons and not forgetting how we get to the, the types of um tank metas where people don't enjoy it or warrior metas where they don't enjoy it or mage solo metas where they don't enjoy it and try and rekindle a little bit of that excitement about a class without going back down the road that led to them being broken uh, at the time so that's that's just how it'd be and now that we got that one out of the way the the heavy question about warriors a little bit more of a simple one do you know why that like a lot of these newer gods aren't really shipped with like dances a lot of the time like you go back mm. like neath has dances a bunch of, like the older characters do is it just like a time allotted elsewhere just you, you view as more valuable yeah i think so i i don't know for sure um you know, dances, I think, stopped going with New Gods long before I joined the design team. But if I remember correctly from what AJ has said publicly in the past, you know, those are just a lot of work, a lot of dev time and investment for something that may not have been returning, you know, equal or, you know, close enough to equal to the amount of work being put in. I could be wrong. And I know it's something, you know, it's something that we have definitely we have not forgotten that that's something that players really like. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it would be cool if we can find a way to do something like that again in the future, for sure. Cool. Even the, those, um, the specials, a lot of those on the skins. So it's like maybe a yep. lot of the new gods don't have dances, but a lot of the skins do have some sort of specials or yep. at least the uh, like tier threes and above. For a uh, another more item related question, do you think that currently right now, 10, 13, whatever the patch is, do you think that mages 
specifically have a stat efficiency problem in their current itemization. And while it is may just mentioned first off, like all classes, do you think there's just a little bit too much uh, efficiency in builds currently, I guess is the best way to put it. Hmm. I see. Hmm. N- not really. No, I don't. Um, you know, I think that it is a common thought to want the game to be as it was when, you know, you first started playing or whatever it is, but we, we arrived at a lot of changes for a reason. You know, I think that players look at what mages are building these days and see, oh, you know, a lot of items have 10% pen sprinkled in. Why do those have 10% pen? And forget what it was like when old obsidian shard was just 33% pen by itself. Uh, yep. And it was, you did no damage to tanks. You did no damage to tanks. You did no damage to tanks. Oh, I one shot every tank for the rest of the Oh game. yeah. That was not a better situation, I think, than where we are now. Is it, I don't know, frustrating to see an item have four stats where it used to have two? Maybe um, I can understand, you know, that that desire. But at the same time, those items could have two stats because you got all of your power or all of your pen from one item um, in rod or an obsidian shard. And I think that breaking up those pillars of the build requires that you need to distribute more power throughout and requires that the build curve is going to be a little bit smoother rather than, you know, stagnant into big spike into stagnant into big spike. You know, that's not, uh, that doesn't feel good to play against um, whenever you were very strong and then all of a sudden you're irrelevant. Um, And it doesn't really feel that great to play as because it's like, well, why am I even playing until I get Obsidian Shard? Or why am I even playing until I get Rod? Um, Yeah. And players started realizing that and just going like Rod second because it made your curve good throughout the game. Like you, it, it, extended your power trough in the early parts of the game, but then you hit your biggest spike and every item thereafter gave you another spike because of the rod passive. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of, there are a lot of stats on a lot of items and I understand that that might seem worse than having less stats, but getting them more all at once. I just think from a, from a, design standpoint it takes a lot of the the smoothness out of the power curve of a lot of classes and creates a lot of balance issues to do it that way that's not to say we couldn't do it better or that you know some items aren't bloated Mm -hmm. uh or you know there isn't too much cooldown reduction in the game right now you know something like that like i I think that all of those points are super valid yeah i just don't think that going back to 33 percent pen on obsidian shard is the way to go um or you know gating all of the power behind rod of tahuti passive is the way to go that's just how i feel about it yeah the uh the one that sticks out to me is the rod of tahuti because it used to be like way way back when it was four items ob shard rod or four yeah, yeah four items ob shard rod and then you sold your starter for whatever other sixth item poly soul reaver whatever and right. it was an but you insane... also had boots oh yeah, yeah. So you, you also had... you basically had three items in a build because you needed boots obsidian shard and rod no matter yep. what yeah, and yeah. probably Reaver in that state. So you really only had two items. And, and then, then what if they ha- have a healer, ha- Bobby? And then you had you gotta to gotta get Divine. Yep, you gotta stack. Oh, there's the build. You know? <laughs> we got our build, you know what I mean? Like, I think that build variety is, is a thing that is much, much, much harder to achieve than the average player Impossible. wants to admit that it is. But yeah, I mean, you have more opportunities to build more items now than I think you ever have. And I'd have a hard time believing an argument against that. Yeah. And with the build variety comment, it is when you look at mid and you look at ADC, ADC more than any other role where they do not care about utility. They do not care about anything. They just want the most DPS in a build that they can get. It doesn't matter if, Oh, trans gives, you know, instant or uh, infinite mana and devs gives you that sustain that more power, a little bit of flat pen. So there's more damage in devs, but more cooldown and trans, they don't care about the cooldown. They just want as much power as possible, consistent damage, survivability from the lifesteal. So it's really hard with those side or the uh, the backline roles. I, I do think support struggles with it a little right now because I think Thieves has became a little cozy. But I think yeah. Solos, over its career, has had a lot of build variety. There has been 
so many starter items in solo and i think jungle right now currently we're seeing Addis being built we're seeing jotun's shadow steel or um shadow, uh, shadow drinker. drinker i think that's yeah. still a, a tiny bit away from the other two but we've seen so many changes to these items and it's it seems like at least right now from uh, a caster perspective viewer perspective that a lot of them have to actually like think about what they're building and not other than mid mid might be the uh the one currently where they can kind of build the same thing but yeah and genetics makes a good point where while thieves may be a little cozy the relics really make it so not every game is going to be the same because of just how different the relics play but it, it at least feels like a lot of the builds you can go are a lot more open some games you want pesty some games you want that onis some games maybe you want that shoguns and solo lane so I, I do think build variety right now is pretty open at least from that more viewer perspective yeah, glad to hear it. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that, that Thebes takes up a little bit too much of the power budget of support builds. That's a dangerous one to touch. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, you know. I, I get it. I get it. Now with Season 10 coming to an end, Worlds is next week, uh, and then looking forward to Season 11. Before we even touch on Season 11, how do you compare this season as a whole compared to just Season 9, just the previous season? Do you think, are you happy with how season 10 has went so far are you maybe a little indifferent with some of the changes you made like from season 9 to season 10 the season as a whole what do you what do you feel about it yeah i think th this year like year 10 versus year 9 because we went to this new season structure right of yep. multiple seasons in a year we knew that was going to be difficult internally you know we knew that that was going to be a lot of work uh, and a lot of turmoil on the player base like asking them to learn new things we had reason to believe that players wanted more turmoil like they like those those meta switch ups yeah i think from my personal perspective i think if we had one less season this year well i guess two because we did the season of worlds but that was a lot less gameplay focused mm -hmm. i think three seasons would have been the sweet spot for us where it would have allowed slightly more switch up than usual because in previous years it was, you know, launch and then mid season and then worlds where you kind of yep. got the biggest shake up there in the middle. I think that having an, a one more additional shake up in the year would have been good, but that four was a lot to ask of the player base to adjust to and keep up with also, you know, for us internally um, just making sure that those ideas are as good as they can be, as polished as they can be, and as fun as they can be. You know, I think all things considered, I'm I'm very proud of the work that we did this year. I think that coming up with two additional mid-season patches, which is really what that we did. That is wild when you say it like that. Um, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. It, it was difficult. I think we did a really good job. You know, I think we... I also think for what it's worth that our God lineup this year was sick. Um, yep. I think every God that came out this year, you know, I was looking at like the year releases and I'm very biased, uh, of course, because this is the year with, you know, a lot of my gods coming out, but I think Lermy <laughs> did like an unbelievable job on her gods and clumsy killed it with Surtur as well. And I think our God lineup this year was really, really fun. And, uh, to do, to, to have as good of God releases as we had and do as many big meta shifts and like you know we reworked healing this year that is a terrifying thing to do like yeah. the the danger what i i think that the healing meta that uh we had after season of hope launched was the most mild healing meta of all time like think of the old like hell afro raw metas where it was just pure sustain all the time yeah, it was there was more sustain in games, but it was so much less frustrating in my opinion than what than any other healing meta we've ever had. Uh, yeah. And that was with us reworking, uh, you know, doing massive changes to almost every healer god, adding new healer items, um changing the way the system works, all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of we we could have done some serious damage to the to the game. Um, with those and some would argue that we did but i would argue that they're wrong we came out on the better end yeah uh, for sure. outside of, you know after all those changes so to to ta you know reworking healing is something that could have we could have taken all year to do that and i still would have been nervous that we didn't do it right 
to do that in the middle of this season or this year where we did so many other big, big shifts as well. Yeah. I think uh, I'm definitely proud of the work that, that the team put in on that. Yeah. When, when you, when you talk about the year as a whole, there's actually just so much that went into this year and mm -hmm. the healing meta was, I mean, it was a little frustrating as somebody that played during it, but it, it is different playing against Paul's hell in season eight. And if you didn't instantly one shot him, you lose the fight because he's just full healing himself and his entire team. And that was probably bottom three meta all time with, with the hell mid meta. So sure. Maybe, maybe the utility supports wasn't the most fun to play against, but yeah, once the numbers came down, I think it's for sure came out on for sure. At least it's came out on the better side so far. Maybe, yes. maybe something in the future completely messes with it or something, but yeah, now, it's going to be nothing but healers at worlds. It's going <laughs> to yeah, be, it's going to be brutal. Like everyone's going the new healing items and yeah, I'll be, I'll be very, you'll, you'll see me drinking in the crowd as soon as that starts <laughs> happening. <laughs> Moving on from season 10. Is there anything about season 11 that you're kind of willing to share goals or just stuff in season, uh, season 10 that you just really, not that you didn't like, but that you're kind of over with season 10, anything in that regard? Uh, no, I don't think I can give you any official spoils. Um, I do think that a lot of things we have on the, on the plans for year 11 are really exciting. I think there are a couple things that players have really been asking for that we were able to do. And I think that they'll be excited about that. And yeah, I think that's basically all I can say. Unfortunately, uh, you don't have to wait too long. Patch notes are Saturday. That uh, is crazy. So that is get, crazy. Buckle up, dude. We'll be talking for Six hours straight. Not really, but uh, definitely at least two. Um, they gave you two about, hours. Yeah, they gave us like two, uh, <laughs> two, two and a half. Um, <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, it's we're going to have to squeeze in order to get that in. To get all that, we 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 got a lot of stuff in for, for season 11. So I, I hope everyone likes it. Got us all excited for Saturday now, Agro. I know. Uh, and you're excited to, to not spoil yet, but you'll you'll spill the beans in a few days. I will. Um, I will. So I know this is a another kind of contentious thing with that warrior, the same warrior vein. Uh, with what? What's the warrior's job? What's just your opinion? Obviously, there's multiple of you in balance, so it's it's just really your opinion. What is your opinion on reworks? God, yeah, or I guess items too. If you want to just speak on them both, quick. Sure. I think when it comes to items, it is different than gods. For me personally, I personally think that reworks are exciting. There are a lot of caveats to that though. Yep. They have to maintain the identity of a god. Um, they have to maintain the original goals of a god. They need to just be there to fix some problems um, that, they, that they had. And, you know, I think some people would point to the work that the team and I have done on gods like Sir Ket, and Erlang Shen as indicators that reworks are not particularly successful. And I think that that isn't really what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about like what we did to Loki back in the day, where that uh, is more yep. of a true rework to me than what we were able to do for Sir Ket and Erlang. I think that the Loki example where we can dedicate a significant amount of development resource to changing some issues that a god has while maintaining their original identity is very, very strong. And for me, I started playing Smite because I was super interested in what these myths would do in a game, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, oh, you know, what, how would they take the, the lore of Apollo and transform that into a, a, a character that fights, uh, you know, in a game like this, that's what I find the most interesting and nothing motivates me to play uh, smite or any MOBA more than a kit that I feel like I really want to master. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, if, if I feel like I've gotten what I can out of uh, a character's kit, and it has its issues. And then I see, oh, hey, we're changing this kit that had some issues. Like, come try out this new ability or whatever. Uh, that makes me want to log in and play, like, instantly. That's my personal opinion. But, again, not necessarily indicative of the rest of the team. Um, for items, items are so much easier to replace. 
and easier to get confused. Like, imagine, for example, uh, Bulwark of Hope was in the game for nine years. I miss uh, him. Did the same thing. Imagine if we brought back Bulwark of Hope. This is not a spoiler, by the way. We brought back <laughs> Bulwark of Hope, and it just did something totally different. But it had the same art, and it was in the same spot, but had a totally new path that had nothing to do with the shield. That wouldn't make any sense, yeah. right? Why wouldn't we just make a new icon? You know, it's not as simple as, hey, new icon. You know, like we have uh, a bunch of artists that are very talented, that um, have a lot of work to do, that we'd be, you know, we need to budget for that. But for the most part, reworking an item, we do it from time to time, particularly on less successful items. You know, items that haven't found nearly as much popularity. They don't have as much as a, of an identity, so you can change it more easily. Um, but for the most part, we would just make a new item if, if we wanted to do that. But, you know, we also have limitations there. Trees can only have four tier three items. Tier three items need to have the stats that their tier twos and tier ones have. Those two things limit you more than you would think when it comes to, when it comes to making new items. So, um, yeah. All right. And and it's, it, it seems like when you do god reworks it's when the the frustration factor is there where it's just like the character is not good for the majority of the team or majority of the enemy team if that's the case because contentious i know persephone rework not a lot of uh love but from the point of view of somebody that had to play against old persephone yes it was fun to like try to master a somewhat difficult character but playing against a good persephone like any SPL mid, literally any of them, because it wasn't that hard to really master. It was. I feel like no. I feel like there were only like three people who were actually good at it. No like, man, bro. Well, I'm Benny, saying actually like really, really good. Okay, like, maybe it was slightly different, but that's true with like comparing like Paul with almost any character to like the average sure. SPL mid laner. But right, it, it literally was impossible, impossible trying to dive like a Shinto Persephone, and it just made the game so unbearable. And yeah, maybe not a lot of people love the the Persephone rework, but it's the same way like some people aren't going to like the Loki rework where they miss that split, split pushing aspect, but is it really that help, healthy for the game for the other nine players in the lobby? Right. No. And there are players who love the way they're like, no matter how unpopular a kid is or how unpopular a god is, there are some subsect of players that love playing Kumbakarna exactly as is. And they would be really sad <laughs> if Kumba got changed. You know, if Kumba got an ability changed, whatever. I am not one of those Me that neither. loves Kumba Karna exactly as he is right now. But there, there is a cost of making a change uh, to a kit that people identify with. You know, for some people, playing Kuzinbo exactly, exactly as is is the reason they log in to play Smite. Um, and... It there has to be significant reason for us to want to. We have to think that there's significant upside in changing it, or that, like you said, Persephone in her previous state was probably costing us some amount of players who came in and were playing against that and and really hated playing against it, mm -hmm. and that outweighed the amount of Persephone players in some way, shape, or form. But you still. I've got a lot of people blocked that kept spamming me with revert <laughs> Persephone for a reason, you know, because there were players who did love that as it was. So there's always, uh, that's always something that, that we have to weigh. And um, now kind of keeping in with just like your opinions of stuff, is there a, and I'm going to preface it with the entire question, but I assume your answer is going to be something specific, but is there a favorite change that you've made to the game so far, whether it's an item rework, an item creation, a God rework, a God creation, I'm going to say, no god creation because for sure your first created character or one of your newest characters is going to be number one on the list so sure no no god that you made yeah fair enough yeah i mean there, there have been a lot of there's so little that is just this is just my thing like yeah. so often it starts with you know this might be my idea but uh Lermy, Clumsy, AJ, you know, someone else makes a suggestion and it changes and, and improves it. Or, you know, I take someone's idea and 
put a little spin on it. And then we really like that. I don't know. I think I remember, I'm pretty sure, Lermy can correct me in chat <laughs> if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that the alternative stacking item, like Tablet of Destinies, was something that that I started in the ideation phase. It was not exactly as tablet as now or exactly as prophetic as now. In fact, I think Clumsy saw my design for tablet and made prophetic which i think prophetic is a cooler version of that type of stacking thing but that idea of these mini game items is something that i really liked i think it was definitely a better version than the earring mini games uh you know that was yep. something that that we had done previously and i think that that was we we had a couple issues with clarity and readability with those that i, I think if we could have ironed those out to start with they would have been better received um and our general direction for them i think was a little misled in what we expected players wanted and it, all of that happens very naturally um you know these are these are just lessons that that we have to learn by releasing these things um but yeah i think those types of you know the tablet and prophetic those types of stackings um i think is is one of the things that i'm proud of starting in some small way yeah i mean there was just metas that were around these items and people really did like those items like those metas and i think they giving you a different way to stack or a different way to play the game outside of just farming afk hitting minions especially when that's like the job of a mid laner i think it makes it a little bit more interesting or on yeah. the opposite side thebes just watching the minions die which is even worse than just clearing the minions but yeah um, i knew it was a hit whenever because i will int for something troll like that all like i knew i was like i'm gonna die here but i'm gonna get six tablet stacks and it's gonna be i'm, I'm gonna be happy with that when other people in the playtest started inting to get stacks, that's when I knew that it was gonna it was gonna work because I'll int for the smallest thing. If I can force Lermy to int, I, I've done something <laughs> really good, um, and that's when I knew it was gonna be it was gonna be well received. When those items were added, you would see in in SPL sometimes people would int for like the prophetic stacks, the support players. Yep. I definitely did it a couple times. I just yeah, needed just a couple a few. stacks. I just needed a couple yeah. stacks, and then I was so strong. I just need this yep. couple and we're good. Yep. Um, but yeah, last question. Maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't. And this is from somebody a asking for solo or troll. And, and the question very simple okay. is, is there a possibility of having three letter, letter, three letter usernames like SOT? Yeah, that I have literally I, I no figured. ideas on. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately not. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Couldn't tell you no idea what the reasons are for you know keeping four as our minimum what it would take to change that anything like that sorry that's uh that that's out of my realm and that's fair unfortunately agra doesn't know everything we'll have to go someplace else to find that some answer. would say anything at all including myself i think um, Miff would probably say that too Miff would definitely say that yeah for sure uh that's all the questions that i have written down but if we have 10 minutes, maybe, if, if you guys have any questions you want for aggro, whether it's about balance, obviously, if it's about season 11, he's probably not going to answer it, but if there's anything that you guys have that you guys are curious about him, uh, ask away, and then aggro will just pick from the chat anything that he sees that, that he does like. Sure, I can uh, I can do that. Yeah, definitely would recommend not asking me anything about year 11, because I won't be able to, to tell you anything. Um, Unless he really likes one of you guys, maybe... There is no one in chat that uh, that I've seen. You know, maybe <laughs> if my wife is watching, she could ask, and I would say, I'll tell you after the stream. Um, <laughs> that's all there is to it. Uh, will Xe and Chins ever be replaced with new core items? Never say never, um, but they do their job well. They're clear in what they in what they do, and there is something to be said with you know, players coming back if they haven't played in four years and they come back and they go, oh, thank God, at least X is still here. You know, at least Chins is still here. That helps uh, at times. So um, again, never say never, but that that isn't something that we are currently considering. Any plan at all to remove MMR and ranked? Um, not to my knowledge. I don't really know. I don't really understand why you would want. Oh, MMR cap. Oh, yeah, I understand. He changed the question. MMR yes, cap. Yes. MMR cap. Yes. We are, we are working on 
things to do with the MR cap. Um, we we don't like how that system is currently working right now, and we want, we definitely. Are there any gods that are you are eager to make but can't figure out a way to translate in game? Not really. Um, there are lots of gods that I'm really eager to make, um, but the issue isn't translating them in game so much as we can only bring so many into the game at any given time, and those spots are uh, very valuable. So there are a couple. I'm not going to name any names. Um, but yeah, there are a couple that I really uh, hope we get to do um, and that I get to do specifically because I think there are some cool ones. Is the keynote cool? Yeah, I think it's pretty cool, Lermy Wormy. Thanks for your question. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think it'll be good. I think people should watch it for sure. Well, at least Agra likes the keynote. That's good. I like the keynote. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was good. Um, looking for any future God synergy type relationships, like how Horus and Set play off each other. Oh, I, this is a good one. I'm yeah, curious about this one. I don't think so. I mean, it, 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 it's not a never thing. I'd be shocked if we ever did a dual release like we did with Horus and Set. That was crazy. Uh, I wasn't working on design at the time, but from everything I've heard, that experiment did not go great. Um, Wait, really? Yeah, it was just double the work. Uh, oh, okay. I thought the like the release frame. of it. Didn't go great. No, no, just like for the pipeline. Um, yeah, yeah. But I thought, I still think Horus and Set dual release is one of the hypest moments we've ever had. I it, loved as it. As a player, I loved it. Set is one of my favorite kits ever. Um, so that that doesn't hurt. Um, but yeah, I think the synergy thing, it just, with a competitive game, it just gets a little bit too cheesy too quickly. You know, we don't really want to add another layer to an already deeply complex game. So, yeah, I, I, I'd be surprised if we did something like that. Um, Kitten of Doom, who probably is a really good QA uh, worker, if I had to guess, I don't know, said, what has been the most challenging part of becoming a designer? Well, it's a lot more work than being a caster. I mean, Bobby can tell you right now, casting is as easy as it can possibly get. Unless uh, you're with Mifflin. I've heard unless that. Unless you're with uh, Mifflin. That's, that's true. Else. That is true. No, I mean, casting was just a lot more natural to me. And I think design has definitely challenged me a lot more in terms of making me work really hard. I think that, you know, managing my schedule and not letting myself work a whole lot of extra hours just because it's something I enjoy doing. Like, I think that maintaining work-life balance has been a lot harder, but I think I've been getting better at it. And I think in design, it, when you're casting... And maybe you're casting a game that isn't particularly entertaining, but you're trying your best. Uh, and, you know, you go look at the feedback thread afterwards and it's like, wow, this game was boring. Um, but, you know, the cat and the cast sucked too or whatever, like that, <laughs> that type of stuff, like didn't really bother me a whole lot. I think I've found it harder to not be bothered by people being upset when, or, or like, you know, saying that we don't care or uh, that we are intentionally negligent, um, you know, anything like that. I think that those things bothered me more than I thought they would when I first moved over to design and that I feel like I'm trying harder than I ever try had to try when I was casting and people are more uh, angry and mean than they ever were when I was casting. And so that le it's like in my brain, it's like, well, if I'm trying harder and doing more things, then that should translate into people understanding that even if this isn't their favorite or whatever, you know, they're going to be more understanding. And um, I think that was one of the, one of the harder parts. Oh, clumsy. So I'm, I'm like answering all the employee questions, which I shouldn't do, but clumsy brings up a really good point here. Why is it that you shirked your responsibility and did not make the blob? <laughs> Have you heard of the blob? No. Uh, Bobby, this is, it's not my idea. It's heroines. I'm going to give him full credit. Okay. Imagine a smite god, okay, called the Blob. He right. has no abilities. He can buy no items. He's just a big blob. His movement speed is locked to like 100. So he's very slow, but he's basically unkillable, okay? He's got like maybe 500,000 pips of health, like an Odin cage, you know? You're not going to kill him. Okay. But he one-shots any enemy god that he touches. 
So you're clearing, you know, you're clearing your wave and you just see the blob moving slowly across the ground at you. And it's like, guys, we got to, we got to start doing something. The blob's going to be at my tower in five minutes. Like we're on a, we're on a clock here, you know, or you're like, you think you know where the blob is, but then he's been sneaking around behind you to fire giant this whole time. He spent 25 minutes crawling his way. And right as you're about to win, he blobs on you and he touches you and insta kills you. You make it sound like the blob is small. I was imagining. No, he's like, big. Ma- he's How big. is he sneaking up behind you then? Wouldn't you like well, see him over flat. the walls? He's like kind of flat across oh. the ground. You know, he's not, you can't see him coming. You can only feel him coming. You know what I mean? Can he like go through rocks and walls? No, no. Does he hit towers? No, that'd be broken. Yeah. So he. He's an instant kill. Oh, so you're, that's like your next thing. That's your 11 is the blob. I mean, clumsy said, why haven't you, why have you shirked your duties and and not made the blob yet? Sounds like Uh, he is wanting it. I agree. No, I will say my bosses, I have done this shit post many times in meetings and they have told me if you have extra time, you can do it for like a fun thing for us. And then maybe we'll put it in for like, you know, April fools or something like that. Imagine if you're Q and ranked on April 1st, Bobby, <laughs> and I'm just blobbing at you. I'm just slowly crawling towards you. Nothing you can do. That'd Honestly, be awesome. It would be kind of fun. It would be fun. It would be kind right? of fun. It would be great. So maybe, maybe I'll look at my calendar when I get back from Worlds. Maybe <laughs> I can get that done in time for April 1st, but I haven't done it yet. And I'm deeply disappointed. Okay. I'm going to scroll up and answer like a couple actual questions. Can I give a hint to the new God? No. <laughs> um, when is skill based matchmaking coming to the game? That is all matchmaking is inherently skill based. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, uh, did you see the uh, I don't know if you saw it, the league matchmaking changes that oh, they're, they're having? changing to, to true skill 2. Yeah, are you do you have any comments on that? I don't know if you want to. No, explain. I didn't read the article, I didn't okay. read the article quite yet, but I, I knew I'm vaguely aware of what true skill is. Um, yeah, it's a their yeah. team, their, their community does not seem super excited nope uh there is no winning when it comes to matchmaking that's that's yeah. my unofficial stance i have nothing to do with matchmaking whatsoever but i think there are so many so many factors in a moba in particular about how uh, a player's skill can be determined you know we don't have you have a particular rating for each individual god but we could right? Like that would technically be more accurate that you could be 2000 MMR on raw, but 1750 on Poseidon. And it's just whatever you decide to play that game. That would your be team wild. Are holding it. You know what I mean? You could be getting off rolled. You could have a particular, you could really struggle when you play against Baron Samadhi. That God just has your number. You're a worse player against that God. How can we ever factor that in to a matchmaking thing that you're against Baron, uh, a, a God that you historically int into, you know, what, a what if you just are having an off day missing, like a player who's 3000 MMR, who just is not having their best day could be a 2000 MMR player. Cause they're mechanically carried. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's impossible. And then multiply all of that by 10. Yeah. That and then is... add in parties. Like it's an, it's an impossible thing. It's not to say that we shouldn't, try and make better matchmaking but any any moba where you think the game should all be 100 percent even and fair is it's it, it's a pipe dream like it just can't happen and it's even beyond that because there's like potential for getting off rolled because there's five yep. different roles that your different skill level in all of them like you said you might not play as well and it's like People that think that there's ELO hell, like, oh, I'm in this 2K MMR and I'm going positive a few games in a row. Maybe your teammates had a bad game and your 09 circuit inted early and started tilting a little bit. Like, there's so many human elements on top of already a bunch of randomness in the game. So it's there's no no such thing as ELO hell. It's just unfortunately relying on consistency from humans is impossible. And with all the other things also on top of it, it is a nightmare yes impossible um but we will continue to try uh why is it hard working with miff 
have you <laughs> see have you like listened to him ever yeah that, i feel like that one's kind of self-explanatory that odin's adventure pvp ve mode was awesome if it was tweaked to be more reward for pvp instead of camps that probably would have been my all-time favorite smite modes yeah i thought odin's odds uh odin's onslaught was awesome and adventures in general are very cool uh and you know we'll be looking into what we can do for those in year 11 for sure uh okay i kind of i kind of lost my place um oh here we go what if, uh, or any chance we get non-conquest type of balance for specific game modes that have blanket changes for any mode? I don't think so, Green Uncle. I think with the way that that system is implemented, it was intended for it to stay blanket across every mode because the clarity isn't there. Uh, like I said, you know, I wish that we could add a little bit more clarity. We might be able to, um, you know, at some point in the future, but until we could get real good clarity in line with being able to see what those changes are they would they will stay blanket which i think is the right is the right call how do you make anti-heal on hunters better i mean it's simple just buff the anti-heal numbers <laughs> um i think for the most part hunters should probably just be killing them without needing to buy anti-heal um not that i think hunters aren't dealing enough damage or anything like that which is i guess how that kind of sounded hunters are not the utility class anti-heal is a utility effect um yep so just left click them more the, uh, is generally what i would say if you made anti-heal for a hunter good that would just have to be a stat efficient item anyway like shadow steel was where it was just so good as is as just a stat stick the anti-heal was just the what's it called icing on the cake or whatever right exactly uh, what if Maui's two would proc on recast instead of a one second wait time? The way it is current, the way it is hard to use outside of an extra aura. Simply during late game when people start to get one shot. I'm a little confused. I think on what you mean by if it would proc. Like if you're talking about the initial protections and movement speed that go out, I think having those happen initial like right away is the easiest way for that to work. Um, yeah, sorry if I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, he, he's just saying that, is there, or what is your thoughts on Maui 2 being a, you cast it one time, you recast it to pull your ally to you instead of having them sit in the bubble for a second? Oh, yeah, we um, we wanted to be sure that players, the the person getting pulled is the one with the agency on whether or not they are getting pulled. Um you know, it, we felt like it was important for that to be an opt-in movement instead of, oh, hey, you're about to get this kill that I want to get. I'm going to put my bubble on you, press two again. I'll yank you back to me and then, you know, get in there myself um, or let my, you know, duo cue partner steal it or, you know, whatever it may be. And there isn't really a good way for other than waiting in it for a player to opt in um, with our current systems. So. That's that's the why it has to be the way it is. Yeah, I did have a really good troll on Clumsy in, in the early Maui playtest. I think I posted it to Twitter at some point. That was that was good stuff. That was a good playtest. I remember, I remember that one. I was making plays out there, Bobby. Just reminis it. reminiscing about trolling Clumsy. Oh, I love trolling Clumsy. It's <laughs> it's he's a he's a good sport about getting trolled, and it's just funnier when it happens to him, I think. It was it was good. It was good stuff. Yeah, any other questions that you saw, Bobby, that you think uh, are worth answering? Uh, the only other one I saw was an idea of adding a seventh item slot, but I think that is just a pretty simple Pretty big one. UI constraint. Yeah. Um, we'd have to rework the entire UI uh, in order to fit a seventh item. And then um, it would also be kind of balanced on top because the game is balanced around six items, power, yeah. stats. What about eight items? What about 10? You know, like why, <laughs> why, why are we stopping at any, uh, at any number at all? Why can't you just buy every item in the, sh in the shop? Um, if you get enough gold, Hey, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah, why exactly. Not? No, the, the issue with all, with all that is always going to be UI. How are we displaying it? That's the big thing for sure. Uh, I think that is all then, unless you have any uh, final things you want to say, anything that, that is on the, the tip of your tongue that you feel like you need to speak before the end of it. Uh, if there's nothing, you got anything? Uh, nope. Hopefully I see everyone at Worlds. Uh, please feel free to come up and say hi. Wash your hands a lot. There's a lot of sicknesses going around. I highly recommend everyone carries some 
hand sanitizer on them, all that kind of stuff. That's, yeah. uh, that's going to be big, but yeah, I hope to see everyone at worlds. Please feel free to come up and say hi, uh, get a picture or whatever. I love doing all that. And, uh, you know, buy gems. That's it. All right. Thank you again, Agro. Thank you for the uh, allowing me to interview and thank you for your insights. I had a great time learning a lot about this and I know other people were very interested in this. So thank you again for taking time out of your day, especially because you could be like designing a God right now or, or researching, but could be spending but time. Said with, I'm here with Bobby with in his me. chat, huh? Yeah, just uh, no, happy to do it. Glad to do another one. You know, once year 11 launches, all that kind of stuff, we can uh, we can do it again. All right, perfect. Thank you again, Agro. Thank you, everyone.